Thank you, Pablo. Um, and hello, everyone up there. I hope you feel included in the discussion. Yes. Um, so, and thanks everyone for listening because it's uh, very late in the afternoon and we're all on different time uh, zones. I know um, I'm supposed to wake up just about now, so hopefully uh, <laughs> I'll be able to communicate. I thought I would start off um, with um, some bad Spanish, um, given where I am, and I apologise to those of you that are English speakers, and I apologise even more to those of you that are Spanish speakers. Es es un gran honor de estar aquí. Quiero dar las gracias a los organizadores por esta oportunidad de reunirnos, and I'll stop there. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm got the uh, gig to talk really about the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I want to pick up some of the themes um, that both Guy and Anna have made, and you'll see some similar things emerging. Uh, of course, getting asked to talk about the Asia-Pacific is a complete um, disaster in many ways, and it's such a diverse area. There's no, uh, very little kind of commonality uh, across the region, and certainly I'm not someone that would like uh, taxonomy or systemization and so forth, because it just, uh, emits many different things. But what I've tried to do is to give you some glimpses of difficulties, um, successes, and some possibilities that maybe engage with what we've, what we've already heard. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the um, extraordinary successes in the area, um, point to some of the problems, look to obstacles to reforming the law, uh, and also point to some examples where people have been able to intervene uh, with some degree of success. So to start off with, let's hear some good news, because I know we're labour lawyers and everything's sort of a disaster and unionisation is declining and so forth. Um, I'm not, some of you may have read work by Steven Pinker, that's all about how everything gets better and better the whole time. Um, and I'm not quite uh, on, uh, you know, fully agreeing with him, but there are a lot of successes that we really do need to take into account. So if we look at this particular uh, slide, which shows the number of people moving out of uh, poverty, uh, and we can debate the statistics and the reliability of the data and what in fact this shows or doesn't show. But if we look at the bottom, um, basically the, 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 the um, orange uh, and the blue parts of the diagram, which represent East Asia and, and South Asia, and we can look at this remarkable de decrease. Um, over, well, since 1990, that diagram shows. Uh, this is from the World Bank. Uh, and this, you know, for so many people's lives in that part of the world, it's made an incredible difference. Uh, and I think we need to start off recognising that sort of success and the implications it has for people's health, for their access to education and so forth. Uh, and the indications are uh, that this will continue. Uh, second uh, little... Uh, vignette, to use uh, Guy's term, is to see even some difference, and I'm going to qualify this in a bit, um, in terms of uh, gender relations, there's been also a significant change in, in terms of access to education. Uh, as I said, you know, there's lots of things, very many things, uh, which are problematic when we talk about gender across many countries in Asia, but this has been another example of success of people, women, getting access increasingly to education across the region. Um, and in, in addition, we can talk about you know, continued strong growth rates in many countries, not everywhere, not in, in uh, either some very poor places like Afghanistan or some of the wealthier countries like Japan and Australia, but generally that part of the world's done much better than most other places, and generally a fairly low unemployment rate and a, a declining share of self-employed work. Uh, so these are some of the things we can point to that will, uh, I think, qualify any uh, bad things I might come to, uh, like now. Um, so some of the bad things are uh, one of the issues that I'm glad has got a lot of discussion in this conference is work safety. Uh, and that's an area where a lot more could happen in Asian countries, including a lot of those countries that have seen successes in other areas. Uh, and if you can see from this diagram, 
um, which uh, has been produced by an interesting study that involves scholars from Singapore and Finland, uh, that the, if we're looking at work-related mortality, and it's quite difficult to compare statistics between countries here, but we can see that still in Asia as a whole, um, the you know, number of deaths in Asia is, is greater than what you'd expect given the rate of overall employment. And it's something I'll, I'll come back to in a second. It's often um, because the, I mean, the legal infrastructure, the regulatory framework is, is quite weak. Um, and we might describe that as a, a low hanging fruit. Um, another issue that, that Anna spent a lot of time talking about was informality. And again, in many countries in Asia, this remains a persistent problem. Um, the point of this slide is to show the link between uh, informality and political instability. This slide uh, shows a recent riot in uh, part of Jakarta where there's a large number of informal workers and many of you will have noted in the press, actually I have to make sure I look at you as well too on my inclusion principle. Um, many people uh, noted, uh, sorry, so, so many people will know that after the recent presidential election uh, there was uh, some violence that broke out afterwards uh, in relation to the legitimacy of the result. And uh, some uh, colleagues of mine have identified that part of the uh, unrest was not simply because their preferred candidate had lost, but to complain um, about uh, levels of informality, and that was an opportunity to express the dissatisfaction by uh, participating in a large-scale demonstration that became are quite bloody. So uh, there's clearly a link there in many parts uh, of Asia and other parts of the world uh, between these levels of informality. It's a problem not just for the workers themselves but for the stability of the society. Another challenge in the region is demography. This is a, a diagram that was given to me by Professor Kazuo Sakano, recipient of the award that, that Mark just got today. Um, and he uh, this is a shocking uh, diagram, if you like, if, you, if you're from Japan, because it shows what's going to happen uh, into the future if current projections uh, continue. So uh, I know it's quite a complicated diagram, but essentially what you're looking at is the, um, this part shows you people in work who will, other people will depend on, whether they're children or older people. And you can see what's going to happen in the future is that, as a proportion of the population, is going to drastically shrink with the ageing of the society, uh, which will mean that, uh, quite, uh, you know, that, that society will become dependent on an increasingly uh, large, well, increasingly, sorry, small group of people who have a lot of, uh, carry the burden for making that society function. This is by no means confined to Japan. Um, and not just confined to Asia, but it, it's certainly a huge challenge. And then having said that there have been some significant progress in terms of gender relations in the area, there are still many areas of difficulty. And this uh, is a couple of illustrations of that. One is uh, an interesting survey which is uh, cited by a recent ILO report out of the Bangkok office talking about um, which was uh, involved a Gallup poll asking the question, it is perfectly acceptable for any woman <coughs> in your family to have a paid job outside the home if she wants one. And you can see that significant numbers of people, more men than women, uh, disagree. There's a lot of variation across the region there. Um, but uh, there's still, uh, you would think, quite unacceptably high number of people uh, that object to the idea of women working. Uh, and then if we look at labour force participation rate, uh, we have, this is a particular issue in South uh, Asia, uh, which is an extraordinarily low rate in world standards. Uh, the, in, in Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia, it's quite comparable to many other parts of the world, but the participation rate of women in, uh, in countries like India is, is, is very low and a lot of suggestions are is actually decreasing. And I know there's been a lot of work on that question. Many of you here may know much more about it than I do. Uh, but 
uh, I know it's a puzzle for people that have investigated in exactly what is occurring there. So there's a lot of problems still in the region and what I want to turn to now is to look a little bit about how these questions could be addressed, these and other questions could be addressed. Um, we've just heard about, um, from both um, Guy and Anna, about the sort of ILO approach to reform, and we've seen you know, great success recently with the adoption of the new convention that Anna described. Um, but it is predicated on a particular view of society that um, sits very comfortable in a, in a social democratic framework, a kind of Jürgen Habermas view of the world, and uh, you know, involving terms like social dialogue and tripartism and so on. Um, and from a normative point of view, that of course is very attractive. But in many countries of the world, and not least in the Asian area, that seems to be uh, quite difficult uh, quite uh, unrealistic in a lot of ways in terms of how policy is actually implemented. Uh, so there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, uh, in some countries that sort of model can work, at least in part, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. Uh, but for other reasons, uh, that model's very problematic. Uh, and one of the problems is something that's already been discussed. Um, Mark referred to this as well, and uh, Alan, I mean, it's, it's just there's issues of populism, and Asia, of course, has not been immune. We can think of places like the Philippines. Um, we can think of attacks on judiciary in places like Cambodia. Um, even in my own country, uh, we can look at stacking of tribunals uh, so that, you know, notionally, tripartism would suggest that industrial tribunals have an roughly equal share of business representatives and, and unions, uh, but of course it's open to governments to just appoint business people, for example, or their friends, and that's characteristic of uh, recent Australian appointments. Uh, so, again, we can look at other countries as well, uh, difficulties in India and so forth, that mean the institutions that are vital to keep up processes of social dialogue and debate within a country start to be undermined. Um, another issue is crackdowns and closures, and this is uh, very worrying, I think, any people in the room that have been involved with NGOs in many countries across Asia will have experienced a lot of concern uh, about the dynamic generally, but also about individuals that uh, can be put at great risk. Uh, and I would suggest for, for those of you outside uh, many of these jurisdictions that are cooperating in, in some way in a country such as, for example, China, to be very careful with the people of the of the people with whom you're dealing, not to put them in any danger, because we see increasingly uh, attempts to or, or effective closures of, for example, uh, centres that provide advice to labour uh, and including migrant labour. In, in to refer to China again, uh, there was quite a strong growing. Uh, oops. Whoa. <laughs> Maybe I should move to the next top. No, no, I'm sure it's all right. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> what happens is that in a number of... Uh, the a large number of advice centres are tied to universities that were a very important source of information and eventually uh, they you know, began to be shut down and often the reason for this is from foreign funding and we see the same thing occurring in India with large numbers of NGOs also uh, having their registration, um, well, those that are eligible to receive foreign funding having their, uh, their registration uh, withdrawn, their licences cancelled. So this, uh, these attacks on NGOs mean that as much, you know, ideas of social dialogue and finding people to talk to become really problematic as the public space of debate becomes constrained. Another one on this page is uh, dedicated to uh, Colin and Julia and uh, uh, Pedro, people that work uh, <laughs> Pablo, sorry, Pablo, in the, in the uh, Labor Law Reform Unit, uh, who are used to doing all sorts of really good work um, and having it 
go nowhere. Colin's written about this, um, but sometimes it does go somewhere, doesn't it, Colin? Um, where you, you have a lot of good ideas uh, and political processes just don't enable uh, it to go forward. Uh, so an example of, of that is the uh, 2002 uh, National Labor Commission in India, which recommended a lot of uh, reforms to the um, to their quite archaic uh, laws in, in many areas. And uh, until now, uh, those really haven't been implemented, although obviously we've had a new government, uh, well, the same government re-elected there with a stronger majority. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But many ideas just get nowhere because they're not made priorities, because the bureaucracy is not in a position to implement them, there's no champion and so forth. But having sort of pointed to those difficulties, I wanted to pick just some examples, and they're really, they are vignettes in the way Guy was talking. So they're the sort of things you would find in a World Bank stroke ILO publication, a glossy one which has, you know, C text box and talks about something succeeding. So they don't really point to any kind of systematic hope for the future, the kind of option two that Guy was talking about, like, you know, it's not like everyone's going to start doing this, but it, but it is a bit of a caution against despair and uh, people that wake up in the morning and think, you know, well, let's just sort of close the conference now because we're all going to be robots or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to point to some successes and I'm thanking some people in the room that have helped me with, with this. Uh, the first one is Korea and it's a very qualified success and Aileen uh, talked to me about this. Um, so very recently there's been some major changes to health and safety law in South Korea. And South Korea was a country where this disconnect between economic prosperity and work safety was quite strongly manifested. So much higher rates of fatality in South Korea that you would expect given the degree of economic prosperity in that country. Uh, and then, so after a lot of pushing by the trade union movement, um, there was uh, late last year adopted uh, so the most significant reforms to work safety law in that country. Uh, since 1990. Uh, now, it's been what finally got through was problematic. It, uh, it does, it goes part of the way to shifting responsibilities uh, for work safety beyond the employment relationship, you know, looking at head contractors and so forth. What finally made it through uh, the legislature was heavily compromised and has been uh, criticised in a number of different ways. But nonetheless, it's a significant advance, including important changes such as a worker has the right to remove themselves from a dangerous situation, uh, which many countries still don't have. So again, this is an example of where sort of roughly and with limitation, the tripartite social dialogue process can still occur uh, in a country um, in, in Asia. Um, another example is from my own country, and again, it involves work safety. Thirty, you'll be really pleased about this. That um, so, the um, this is a reform that was put together in the uh, 2011, and involves uh, really moving completely away from the employment relationship as the touchstone for work safety. Uh, and it's like people uh, was channeling Mark. Uh, and uh, enacted this law. So it doesn't use employer and employee, or only in a very minor way, it uses a completely different language, worker, workplace, and the rather inelegant phrase of a person conducting a business or undertaking. But it has been used to transcend all the difficulties, well, many of the difficulties that people talk about, gig economy and so forth. Uh, and that's one which has now survived political changes, which, uh, you know, we're a more conservative environment. And, and part of the reason for that is that the law is demonstrably uh, successful. You can see there the rates of injury falling, uh, also being reviewed by a very competent, independent person who had the trust of the parties, who's able to say, look, this system is working, it needs some changes and so on. So if you can show something works, um, even if it's quite a radical reform, as it was the case with, with that, um, you may be able to continue it despite political changes in the country. Uh, the third example uh, is from Vietnam, and many of you will know that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the National Assembly uh, has ratified Convention 98, which is a huge deal in a communist state, like to be prepared to 
uh, have a freedom of association of sorts with some qualification and so forth. But it's a major step. Of course, there was external pressure on Vietnam, but a lot of this was driven by domestic scholars, by uh, advocates and so on, and by union activists and, and so forth. And, and it's a remarkable, uh, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen, but it's just a remarkable testimony to getting a lot of different people going together, coming together and working in an environment which you think would not be very conducive, uh, and some major reform might be away in, those, in that country. And the last uh, examples I wanted to give uh, refer to the difficult environment I mentioned before, namely China, and hopefully there won't be any more noises. Um, but uh, it is very difficult in China. People that have some people in the room have worked for a very long time uh, know that things are difficult in terms of space to discuss things. Uh, you know, being much more uh, limited than used to be the case. But even there, people are able to adapt and find things that they can work on. Uh, and two examples of that, firstly, scholars are publishing a lot on issues around the gig economy. Uh, of course, I know that's sort of so Amsterdam, but um, the, it's nonetheless uh, something where people in China can do a lot of very innovative work and uh, both in a scholarly sense and also in terms of judicial innovation. This is just a, um, this is someone who works for a delivery uh, firm that was the subject of uh, a, ser a number of cases uh, in Beijing uh, in which the courts found that the, uh, that for, at least for the purposes of a workplace injury, that the couriers who were uh, doing work under platforms were um, employees at least for that purpose, and quite sophisticated judgments and that. So even in difficult, very difficult situations where you're not going to get freedom of association tomorrow or I don't know when, but you are having people that are working really hard to try to, you know, have spaces where they can bring in innovation, make some sort of improvements to what the law is like. So we'll stop there um, and then I think we can have some discussion if people aren't um, out of the time zone completely now.